we have our our final our final speaker uh, definitely uh, last but not least we have uh, jason reza georgiani uh, who is an iranian american philosopher and lifelong native new yorker he he did his ba and ma at new york university and completed his doctorate in, at the uh, of, in philosophy at the state university of new york and uh, jason is is an author of eight books um, his first book, Prometheus and Atlas, won the 2016 Book Award for the Parapsychological Association. He's also the author of World State of Emergency, Lovers of Sophia, um, and many more. And he's also the founder and leader of Prometheism, um, or, the, or the Prometheus movement. And I believe uh, in, in, in Jason's uh, today's lecture, uh, which is titled Modernity as an Event Horizon for Promethean Future, We'll definitely hear hear more about his uh, his concept of, of Prometheism and the figures of Prometheus and Atlas. So I, I'll I'll give that over to you now, Jason. Thank you, Simon. Sorry again for the time confusion. Uh, I've been uh, sitting here looking forward to talking to you all. And um, as you suggested, uh, I mean, you could have solicited a talk on any subject from me, but since you did ask me to talk about a Promethean vision of the future. Uh, that's what you're going to wind up getting, so for better or for worse. Uh, so here we go. It's going to be about an hour-long lecture, I would say, and then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A, if that's okay with you. Sounds good? Perfect. Yeah? Okay. Modernity as the event horizon of a Promethean future. The future is both the most promising and the most dangerous idea in human history. For most of recorded history, the idea of the future remained inconceivable to people in all of the great civilizations of Earth. These ancient civilizations, whether in the Americas, Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, or in South and East Asia, all had cyclical conceptions of time and mythical worldviews oriented towards an ideal past. Despite certain specific differentiations, the cosmologies of the Mayans, the Greeks, and the Romans the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Hindus, and the Chinese all conceived of time as a decline through a series of world ages that were each increasingly degenerate departures from a bygone golden age lost in the primordial past. They all believed that this epochal de decline would end in some worldwide catastrophe, which would usher in a new golden age through the return of the heavenly deities to earth. The cycle would then restart being destined to inevitably end in decline and destruction over and over again for all of eternity. Traditionalists who want to retrieve this pre-modern worldview see chaos as a mere degradation of order. To them, order, which is called rata in Sanskrit and cosmos in Greek, is an eternal structure of being. This is conceived of as a macrocosm which may be mirrored or distorted to a greater or lesser degree of fidelity by the microcosm of the individual person and the collectivity of a society. The order itself never changes. Even its variant instantiations on the microcosmic level follow fixed patterns of increasingly degraded fidelity until the gods, the Hindu devas or Greek Olympians, restore order at the end of every cycle. By contrast, the essence of modern thought about the relationship between order and chaos is that emergent and determinate order draws from out of a background of indeterminate chaos as a wellspring of innovative creativity, thereby yielding progress in all domains, albeit not necessarily in anything resembling a straight line, and potentially admitting of many dialectical regresses and triangulations within an overall forward-oriented developmental trajectory. All legitimately modern thought is teleological in this way. The teleology of the future, French l'avenir, German die Zukunft, Persian Ayande. The teleology of the future as what is to come and what is coming into being is an idea that is encompassed by my concept of the spectral revolution. This is a concept that I first developed in Prometheus and Atlas, which was written in 2012 and published in 2016. In understanding what I meant by the spectral revolution, and how it is integral to the Prometheus vision of the future, let us start with the word specter. 
The word Prometheus is employed here as a contraction of Prometheus and theist. In other words, someone who has embraced Prometheism. The word specter has a number of different meanings. One of the reasons why I chose it to develop the concept of the spectral revolution is because of its polyvalence or multiplicity of meaning. I wanted to capitalize on all of the different meanings that it has. First of all, specter or spectral evokes the spectrum. In other words, a phenomenon wherein there are no sharp divisions or clear distinctions. The spectral is consequently the undoing or undermining of various binary oppositions. For example, the binary oppositions of light versus darkness, being versus nothingness, truth versus deceit, good versus evil, spirit versus matter, male versus female, and left versus right. One thing that I mean to suggest by spectral revolution is the revolution that undoes or deconstructs all of these binary oppositions. This revolution would reveal that we are projecting these binary structures onto the spectrum of phenomena for various utilitarian purposes and that these sharp distinctions are not intrinsic to existence. A specter is also what is yet to come. This is how Karl Marx uses the term specter in the opening of his Communist Manifesto when he writes with Engels that, quote, there is a specter haunting Europe, the specter of communism. In this sense, the word specter is already very closely related to revolution because Marx was advocating a global communist revolution. In any case, the spectral is also what is yet to come. What I mean to suggest by that is that Heraclitus was right that we live in a cosmos that is a process. We do not live in an already completed whole as Parmenides or as the Vedic sages believed with their, con with their concept of Brahman or one unified being that is eternally complete, in light of which our experience of time is maya or illusion. Rather, time is real and nature is a process. The futural or future-oriented character of existence itself makes the world spectral. Once one starts to think of existence as becoming rather than as static being, one realizes that all of these binary oppositions are also only relative and they are constantly deconstructed and reconstructed by the process of existence. The third meaning of specter is the idea of a ghost, which is the most commonly understood meaning of the word. Here, I'm trying to suggest that the essence of technological science is something ghostly. Although we tend to think of science and especially technology as the most materially tangible thing in the world, and despite the fact that our current scientific establishment is working with a materialist paradigm, the whole of techno-scientific development is actually a ghostly phenomenon. It is almost like demonic possession, wherein the archetype of Prometheus is working his will through us onto the world. The question is whether we want that to be a passive relationship or whether we can transform it into an active rapport that is more constructive. I owe the idea of the essence or spirit of technology to Martin Heidegger. I have further developed it from out of his thought. Heidegger is a philosopher whose work is radically historical and self-reflective on the history of philosophy and the history of science. Heidegger was advancing the thesis that our various interpretations of being from epoch to epoch have concealed as much about existence as they have revealed. So we need to be able to understand our process of the interpretation of existence in order to be able to deconstruct these various frameworks that have covered over nature and that have trapped us in a certain perception of the world. In particular, Heidegger argued that from the epoch of Plato onward, there is a trajectory of abstract thinking and the representational relationship to nature, which ultimately yields modern materialistic science with Descartes being the turning point in that trajectory which begins with Plato and ends with Nietzsche's conception of the will to power as its culmination. In that construction, Descartes is something like the fulcrum and Nietzsche is the inversion of Plato. In analyzing that whole trajectory of development, Heidegger identifies the phenomenon of technological science as it is unfolding throughout history as expressing a kind of spirit or essence. However, Heidegger was never clear on what or who this spirit is. 
he made certain innuendos about a potential return of the gods, which would supposedly save us from the total instrumentalization and dehumanization of our existence. He even suggested that, somehow, the particular god or deity who would return would have to transform technology from within its own essence. In other words, Heidegger recognized that we cannot simply escape or retreat back into traditionalist paganism, let alone medieval tradition, and act like the modern technological epoch never happened. Modern technology, Heidegger insisted, has to be transformed in its own essence. There are these hints that I pick up on in Heidegger when I suggest that the God who has to return in order to transform our relationship with technological science is Prometheus. After all, Heidegger evokes Prometheus as the deity of technological science in his rectoral address, the speech that he delivered when he became the rector of Freiburg University. What has to happen is that the mindless Frankenstein's monster relationship to technology that we have hitherto had for centuries now needs to be transformed so that it is a relationship to Prometheus in the positive sense of the deity who gave us techne or craft. Not just technology, but also craft in the sense of poetic creation. Techne was a form of poesis for the Greeks. It was one modality of creative production. So Prometheus is also the god, or rather the titan, who brings us not just the fire of the forge, but all of the arts and crafts. We need to cultivate a more artful relationship to technology that is going to prevent us from being dehumanized. In Prometheus and Atlas, fresh out of doctoral studies and still under the spell of contemporary continental philosophy, I made the mistake of putting the title The Postmodern Prometheus on the chapter wherein Frankenstein features prominently as part of an attempted revival of the archetypal power of Prometheus. I've since come around to realizing that there's nothing postmodern about what I wrote there. In fact, there's nothing to postmodernism at all, other than a cynical psychological warfare and social engineering project that aims to deconstruct the modern just so that tradition can prevail again. Of course, the vast majority of its proponents have not realized that they are dupes being used for this, being used by people who take Julius Evola's Ride the Tiger to heart or who think along similar accelerationist lines about hastening the supposedly inevitable collapse of the modern world. This cynical traditionalist accelerationism ought to be sharply distinguished from futurism, despite the fact that the two became strange bedfellows in the context of Italian fascism and the early working relationship between F.T. Marinetti and Benito Mussolini. Futurism is, in a sense, the defining spirit of modernity as such. A robotic workforce, personal flying cars, cities under the sea, colonies in space, and many other innovations that were expected by the year 2000 were only the surface layer of a deep futurism that spanned from Italy to America and then extended to Japan in the decades after Hiroshima. Even the Russian cosmists of the 1920s were part of this global project to soar headlong into the ever-expanding horizon of the modern age. The Soviet Union embraced its own vision of this Promethean ambition in a bid to rival capitalism with a promise of a more just and universal utopia. Psychotronics, or Soviet parapsychology, was part of this modernist vanguardism. Contrary to what many theorists of the modern assume, modern and modernist movements were not all reductively materialist. This is especially clear when one examines the work of a number of leading modern artists and literary figures from Vasily Kandinsky to Andre Breton and Franz Kafka. Their work is steeped in the occult, even if it represents a radical revolt against tradition. In the realm of science, psychical research and its successors, parapsychology and psychotronics, were uncompromisingly scientific in their methodology and entirely consistent with what actually characterizes the modern mindset. Judging by the empirical rigor of research in the field and the complexity of data analysis, parapsychology or psychotronics has a more legitimate claim to being a modern science than psychology or sociology do. The reason why many theorists have missed this when formulating a phenomenology of the modern or of modernism is that they have mistakenly drawn an equivalence between modernity and anti-tradition. 
The latter is a term introduced by the traditionalist French writer René Guénon in order to designate the aesthetic and material the sorry the atheistic and materialistic form of modern thought that rose to prominence during the French Revolution and was eventually embraced by the scientific establishment of the Western world. In his book, The Reign of Quantity and the Sign of the Times, Gunnan contrasts this anti-tradition with a different modality of modernity, one which he has noticed heralds of as he's writing in the 1920s through the 1940s, but which he believes is yet to come to its culmination. Gunnan calls this the counter-tradition. Unlike the reductively materialist and atheistically secular anti-tradition that was epitomized by the French cult of reason and the Marquis de Sade, the counter-tradition is profoundly spiritual. Gunnan, writing as a staunch defender of perennial tradition, sees the counter-tradition as the ideology of the coming Antichrist. It is the full flowering of modernity. Prometheus and Atlas made the mistake of conflating modernity in general with the anti-tradition and of confusing the counter-tradition that Prometheism represents with something postmodern rather than the fully modern. I affirm Ganon's claim that there really are only two types of worlds, a world of tradition and a modern world. A period like the Italian Renaissance, or for that matter, Hellenistic Alexandria, is an example of a world in transition between tradition and modernity. In the Alexandrian case, the transition was aborted by the institutionalization of Christianity, and in the case of the Renaissance, it was retarded by the Vatican. In writings such as Revolt Against the Modern World and especially Ride the Tiger, Julius Evola was a cynical supporter of certain currents of modernism, having even been a Dadaist painter in his youth because he thought that the collapse of the modern world ought to be accelerated. From his traditionalist perspective, which is most closely aligned with Hindu notions of yugas, or world ages, and the caste hierarchy of a world that ought to be ruled by the devas, the gods, modernity is simply the Kali Yuga, the last and darkest age of deviant degeneracy in a perennially repeating cycle of world ages. Bringing this age to an end sooner by intensifying its destructive forces would therefore accelerate the advent of the new golden age or the next Satya Yuga. The term new age is a source of a great deal of confusion because to some people it signifies this dawning of a new golden age, which is an entirely traditionalist idea, whereas to others it means what it did to German intellectuals who used the Neue Zeit, literally the new age, as a term for the modern age in the German language. Modernity is the age defined by the very idea of the new. Gunnon, after all, saw the New Age movement, which had already begun in his epoch, as the rising counter-tradition, wherein the spiritual takes the form of the psychical that can be grasped scientifically. Gunnon thought that a scientific approach to the occult was quintessentially modern and that the Antichrist would come to power by means of the technological production of miracles. The distinction between modernism and postmodernism in architecture, the arts, including cinema and literature, can be examined with a view to demonstrating that there is nothing positively or substantively new about putatively postmodern works that was not already there in modern works. For example, so-called postmodern architecture is just neo-deco when it is not trash, and Dada, which was sometimes literally trash, is at least as deconstructively engaged in satirical and absurdist parody as anything postmodern. Is Frank Lloyd Wright a postmodern architect simply because he fuses modernist geometric rationalism with ancient decorative motifs from various cultures? Of course not. Wright is absolutely modern. Anyone who thinks that the line between modern and postmodern art and literature is drawn by some rejection of the rational or by a supposed commitment to linear progress, is clearly ignorant of the place of the irrational and the archaic in surrealist art and poetry, which is radically modern. Modernity is the event horizon of the technological singularity. 
This is the notion that various convergent advancements of technology are going to fundamentally alter the parameters of human existence. These include biotechnology or gene editing, robotics and nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, and psychotronics. The first three sections of this presentation will be devoted to examining these various facets of the technological singularity. The vortex around which rapid transformations of modernity revolve as an event horizon is appropriately named a singularity because if one graphs human technological development, at a certain point, the slope on that graph curves sharply upwards and it becomes a spike. While at any point on that graph, one could extrapolate from past data points to future data points and come up with some idea of what further technological progress might consist of and how it would transform society. After all, this is the whole history of futurism and of science fictional visions of the future. When one gets to that spike on the graph, one cannot project from the past to the future. One has reached a moment where the world has been so fundamentally transformed by technological development and this transformation is happening so fast that on account of this exponential acceleration, it is impossible to project forward. Of course, what this also means is that one is reaching the limit of the conceptions that the human mind is capable of forming and the limits of the human imagination. After examining the various mutually reinforcing technological developments converging into the singularity in the first three parts of this presentation, the fourth and final section will focus on how the archetype of Prometheus can guide us in successfully navigating the challenges of restructuring society worldwide in order to survive and thrive in the face of the singularity. My contention will be that only a society structured around the archetype of Prometheus can secure us a future wherein singularity level technologies are constructively integrated into a positively post-human or superhuman community, the actualization of which would represent the culmination of the ever accelerating transformative process that is modernity. How are you all doing? You good? Okay. One, biotechnology. <clears throat> Biotechnology offers us a variety of potentials to promote human flourishing. Using embryo selection, which is an augmented process of in vitro fertilization, where you're able to profile the embryos that are then reinserted in the womb for development, it's possible to eliminate hereditary diseases. It's also known that there's about a 15 point range in IQ between the brightest child one could have and the one that will have the hardest time studying various disciplines. IQ can be increased by around 15 points per generation using embryo selection alone without modifying the genetic structure of the embryo. Of course, intelligence is an imprecisely defined term, but there are certain factors of intelligence that have to do with the ability to learn physics and manipulate complex mathematics, which have strong genetic correlates. It is very important that we establish some kind of consensus regarding how this technology is going to be used. If we were to have a 15 point IQ increase per generation in only one country or one culture, this would introduce a dangerous imbalance of geopolitical power. On account of the history that eugenics has in the Western world, views about using this technology for what are essentially neo-eugenic neo purposes are largely negative in the West. By comparison, the Chinese scientific, academic, and political establishment is almost 100% in favor of using emerging biotechnologies to, for example, enhance the IQ of its population. The specific factors of intelligence that can be manipulated by this process are the very ones that lead to engineering breakthroughs, which historically, unfortunately, have had their first manifestations in military technology. Even within a single country, if only the wealthy have access to this kind of technology, we could see class disparities turn into real caste distinctions between a genetic aristocracy and others who are not so genetically fortunate. The social implications are even more significant when we think about genetic engineering, which actually does modify the genetic structure of an embryo. We can lengthen lifespan. It's been found that mice who have been genetically engineered for a longer lifespan also have compressed morbidity 
meaning that at the very end of their lives, they decline very quickly rather than going through a prolonged aging process. We would also be able to enhance physique. The same techniques that were initially developed to treat Lou Gehrig's disease have been applied to the end of boosting muscle mass and decreasing the chances of obesity. Then, in terms of cognitive functioning, there are also genetic engineering techniques that were developed initially to treat Alzheimer's that have been used to boost memory capacity by two or three times. These particular enhancements sound very positive, but genetic engineering also gives us the capability of splicing human and animal genes. We really ought to ask ourselves whether we want to create a hybrid species. That is not a decision that should be left to one country or culture, let alone a corporation operating in the global free market. One of the most controversial biotechnologies is human cloning. Even if we were to have a fairly widespread consensus that human cloning for the reproduction of identical persons, in other words, the creation of a large number of twins, is not a great idea. Human cloning is implicitly part of embryo selection. It's often the case that when an optimal embryo is inserted into the womb for development, the initial implantation is unsuccessful and another attempt has to be made. Consequently, if one already has arrived at an optimal embryo, cloning that embryo a number of times allows for repeated attempts at implantation. Since cloning is going to be part of augmenting embryo selection, a more acceptable form of biotechnology, there is no telling how else cloning might be used unless we have an effective regulatory system on a global scale. The worst thing that may happen with biotechnology, which also brings us into the domain of robotics or cybernetics, is that some country or civilization might unilaterally decide to genetically engineer a race of slaves. The creators of these biomechanical robots might find a way to convince us that their creatures are not really human beings who would be the bearers of any political rights. Gene splicing that incorporates the elements of the genome of other animals might make it possible for these humanoids to work under adverse environmental conditions that would be difficult for humans to tolerate. This is the promise and the peril of CRISPR technology, which has recently rendered genetic engineering much more practicable and precise. CRISPR has come to broadly refer to a method of appropriating and redirecting the natural mechanism for the repair of DNA, which breaks all the time in response to various environmental stimuli, such as a person being subjected to a standard X-ray. Making the cut in the right place has been compared to placing a cursor between the letters of the Gattaca sequence in the proverbial word processor of the genome before rewriting it. CRISPR is now being used on humans to cure sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, and even cancer. Consider the dual uses of this technology. The same gene editing used to cure muscular dystrophy on a therapeutic basis could be used to enhance muscle mass across the population, not just amongst those who opt in for this enhancement, but potentially in future generations born to parents who choose to have their child's embryo edited. Fyodor Uranov, who worked at Sangamo Biosciences from 2000 to 2016, points out that there is one gene, SCN9A, that makes a protein that is responsible for pain transmission signals. Editing this gene out using CRISPR could help manage terrible pain in cancer patients, but it could also be used to produce special forces soldiers invulnerable to torture. Whereas before CRISPR, gene therapy on humans was achieving 2% correction, the genome of 80% of the cells in a subject can now be corrected or re-engineered. If desired, this can include the cells of germline genetic material, such as sperm and eggs, which would pass any genetically engineered change down onto the offspring of the human subject of the CRISPR editing. Not surprisingly, in 2015, China became the first country in which scientists legally and openly began gene editing human embryos using CRISPR. CCR5 was the gene targeted in the first human embryos edited in China. It is the receptor for HIV, and removing it from the genome of the edited embryos immunized the genetically engineered children against the AIDS virus. 
It was not long before Chinese corporations, such as Darwin Life and Ova Science, were promising their clients designer babies with all kinds of genetic modifications, including enhanced IQ, within a decade. In other words, well before 2030. As President Vladimir Putin recognized in his remarks at the World Festival of Youth at Sochi, Russia, on October 21st, 2017, this technology could be used not just to cure heritable diseases, but to genetically engineer mathematical and musical geniuses or super soldiers who feel neither fear nor pain. Putin suggested that the implications of CRISPR-driven gene editing are more terrifying than the invention of the atomic bomb. He is right. Two, robotics and nanotechnology. To an extent, biotechnology is converging with research in robotics. One of the most recent advancements in robotics research is biomimetic design. This is the idea that we should look to insects and other non-human animals for inspiration in robotics. In particular, robotic spiders and robotic flies that have been developed, which would be ideal for surveillance. They can crawl under your door or fly in through your window. They look like real insects, and yet they're equipped with miniaturized components that allow them to provide surveillance to their remote operator. We will soon be living in a world where one cannot tell whether the insects that one is trying to swat in one's home are actually surveillance drones. More frighteningly, these robotic insects could be designed to mimic mosquitoes with stingers, except that the stinger is a micro syringe that injects poison into a targeted person. Another development that is related to this is work on transformers, robots that can shapeshift at institutions such as Carnegie Mellon. There will soon be biomimetic robots that can change from being a spider into being a fly by reorganizing their structure. So while thinking that one has successfully shooed a fly away, the same robot re-enters one's home in the form of a spider that continues to offer both audio and video surveillance, or in the worst case, carry out the most untraceable assassination. Terrorism will reach another level when drone robotic flies fitted with microcharges can suddenly converge on a targeted person in a park and detonate their explosives near his jugular vein. Progress in the field of nanotechnology means that these robotic systems can be scaled down to a microscopic level. Nanoscale robots could be especially valuable in the medical field as intelligent surgeons that operate within the body on a molecular level, making it appear as if cancers in sensitive areas full of nerves which a scalpel runs the risk of severing, are simply dissolving. Unclogging arteries would also be a lot easier. But the implications of these nanobots for industry are truly astounding. Imagine the 3D printing technology of today being replaced by printers that assemble computer-generated or 3D scanned and modeled objects on a molecular level, akin to the food replicators or holodeck of Star Trek. When combined with weak AI expert systems and human scale robots, as well as airborne drone robotic delivery systems, such robotic assembly on a nano scale would bring the need for every kind of drudgery to an end. What this also means is that sometime within the next two decades, 90% or more of the human labor force will be unemployed. To use Henry Kissinger's terminology, they will suddenly become useless eaters, quote unquote. Anyone outside an elite engaged in creative work and driven by higher goals will be considered a purposeless consumer of robotically produced goods. This revolutionary disruption of the global economic system would be one of the many indications that we have arrived at the event horizon of the singularity and are about to be inescapably captured by its vortex. As the mass unemployment crisis sets in and all contemporary economic models fail to offer financial analysts any guidance, we will begin to feel the gravity of the situation. As with all aspects of the singularity, the effects will not be gradual 
or intensify in a linear manner that can be projected. The robotics revolution and industrial production augmented by nanotechnology will explode at an exponential growth rate until only expert systems are considered remotely competent in even attempting an analysis of the situation and suggesting solutions that would address the implosion of our world financial system. It is also the case that once nanotechnological design becomes feasible, it would be much easier to overcome the locomotion problem in robotics and build robots that are capable of autonomously replicating any human physical movements. Robots with much sharper perception and more subtle dexterity would in turn be able to engage in nanotechnology design and manufacture far more effectively than human engineers. Nanotechnology will also lead to the further integration of robotics with cybernetics and virtual reality. We are now witnessing a proliferation of drones, especially in the context of warfare. One of the technologies that the Pentagon is developing under DARPA is the ability to project a pilot's mind into a drone through virtual reality so that the pilot really feels like he's flying in whatever environment the drone is patrolling. Through a haptic suit, the pilot gets tactile feedback from the airframe of the drone. This begins to give the drone operator a different sense of embodiment than a human being ordinarily has. There are brain interfaces being developed that will allow the pilot to control the movements of the drone without any explicit commands. In other words, by thought alone. The aim here is to improve reaction time in aerial dogfights. But if one combines this system with fully immersive virtual reality, including tactile feedback from the airframe of the drone, are we really even dealing with a human being anymore? Will these drone pilots begin to dream of themselves as some other type of creature? The first form of post-human artificial intelligence may be parasitic on the organic elements of human intelligence. Three, AI and psychotronics. The current model for achieving artificial general intelligence is fundamentally flawed and it will fail. But the failure of mechanistic approaches to engineering artificial general intelligence is going to lead to what I call the spectral revolution. Parapsychologists have been studying what they call psi abilities in high-level laboratories, such as the Pear Laboratory at Princeton University, for a century now. But it has taken place on the margins of the scientific establishment. What is going to happen is that well-funded AI research programs at institutions such as MIT, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon will meet with repeated failures the closer they get to strong artificial intelligence. The scientists working on these projects will notice psychic phenomena in the laboratory and in their computer systems. They will start to deal with weird instances of anomalous information exchange and disruptions in the information processing that are basically what psychokinesis researchers have been dealing with for decades. Consequently, ESP and PK are going to become engineering problems for AI researchers. That is when the spectral revolution will be fully unleashed. When in the course of a hard-minded materialistic attempt to create AI, engineers are just going to come up against these bottlenecks that force them to recognize phenomena that parapsychologists have been studying for a century. Then once that is processed, a different kind of approach is going to be taken toward AI, which involves a lot of biotechnology and robotics or cybernetics. At that point, there will be a breakthrough. That's my prediction. The technological singularity, as I see it, is inextricable from the spectral revolution. These two are going to converge to radically transform our society in ways that most people are not ready for. The more comprehensive genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and robotics become in their approach to analyzing, replicating, and augmenting the function of human organs, including the brain, the more these nuts and bolts research programs would come up against enigmatic psi abilities. ESP and PK would be acknowledged as research and development problems in the development of artificial intelligence 
or in the integration of the brain with cybernetic systems, perhaps for the purpose of downloading human consciousness into an android body. There would be problems of morphogenesis relevant to genetic engineering that could not be solved but by factoring in non-local morphic resonance that quite apart from DNA impacts embryological development by endowing a baby with characteristics of the body that belonged to the psyche that is about to be reincarnated as that child. Ostrander and Schroeder's psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain demonstrated that despite the unequivocal atheism and supposed materialism of the putatively scientific framework of, Marxist, of the Marxist Eastern Bloc, the psychotronics program of the Soviet Union and its satellite states had far surpassed America in government-funded psychic research on latent human abilities such as extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. This makes the case the spectral phenomena are a subject of empirical research in scientific laboratories. To treat such paranormal manifestations as miracles that reaffirm faith in revelation was just a tactic of psychological and social control that self-proclaimed prophets and manipulative clergymen would use on people falsely conditioned to believe that natural abilities which we share with animals are supernatural demonstrations of divine power that lie outside the scope of scientific study. In the 1970s, work was done by psychotronics researchers in Prague to develop devices that would be able to channel and amplify psi abilities. As nanotechnology of the kind that Drexler was already envisioning becomes a reality, such devices could be much more precisely designed. It is also likely that genetic engineers would be able to identify correlates for biological predisposition to becoming a psi virtuoso. They could then edit the genes of an embryo in such a way as to endow children with this trait at birth, potentially on a population-wide basis. Once we reach the event horizon of the singularity in terms of technological development, hitherto marginalized, and suppressed psi abilities would also have to be recognized by mainstream science. At that point, total social collapse on the scale of a planet-wide Salem witch panic will be inevitable, unless we forge a society wherein no one would think to misuse ESP and PK to harm their fellow citizens by committing avaricious or vengeful crimes. Such crimes would be untraceable by normal law enforcement procedures and impossible to prosecute retroactively by means of the established procedures of our impartial justice system. Fourth and final section, the Promethean revolutionary struggle. If we are resolved to secure the forward march or headlong plunge of humanity into the singularity, what is it that we are really willing here, even in the best possible case? Especially considering the convergence of material technologies and psychical techniques with the potential to transform society in the most radical ways imaginable. Singularity level technologies and techniques will mean the end of personal security and individual privacy. The only way for society to survive this transformation is to have a population that consists solely of individuals who always only wish the best for one another. What defines the best, Greek agathon, the good, or kalon, the beautiful, that any person may wish for any other in a given society is the ethos common to that society. If the Prometheus wills to unchain the full techno-scientific potential of the singularity, then given the unprecedented dangers involved, it stands to reason that she will also have to muster the will to forge a Prometheus society worldwide. To the extent that there remain any hostile social or political outliers, there will be worldwide war, 
And such a global conflict with singularity level technologies could bring not only human life, but all terrestrial life to an end without affording anyone the opportunity for a positive transition into a superhuman state of being. We have no more than several decades left to decide whether it is better to let ourselves be regressed to a feudal or archaic pre-industrial society, or whether, we are, or whether we are intent on following through with the technological singularity and the spectral revolution that I argue would come with it. As already suggested above in relation to psychotronics, once we reach the event horizon of the singularity in terms of technological development, hitherto marginalized and suppressed psi abilities would also have to be recognized by mainstream science. At that point, total social collapse on the scale of the witch panics of old would be an eventuality. The only thing to do is to ensure that transgressions using psi ability never take place to begin with. Since in the realm of psychic ability, which functions mostly unconsciously, to intend something, maybe to make it happen, there is no solution other than to make sure that such spectral crimes are unthinkable to whoever remains in society. That would reduce the population base to the same very small minority who could also be trusted never to weaponize nanotechnology or misuse increasingly ubiquitous gene editing abilities in ways that would threaten the public welfare far more seriously than terrorists, thugs, and malcontents were able to do with the tools at their disposal in the 20th century. Evolution is an exclusionary process that selects against the majority of a population group who fail to exhibit a mutation that adapts them to environmental stresses. The selection for a mutation is, as a general rule, a selection for deviation from the norm and the evolution of a few who become the progenitors of a new species at the expense of the many. This selection will take place on the basis of who is capable of embodying the archetype of Prometheus and thus of constructively taking conscious control over the spectral force of techno-scientific development in the maelstrom of the event horizon of the technological singularity. Prometheus is the first freedom fighter. The archetype of Prometheus tacitly reflects a recognition that freedom is the most fundamental fact in the cosmos. The cosmos is inconceivable without consciousness, which presupposes intentionality. Some degree of free will, however conditioned, is a prerequisite of anyone being personally accountable for meaningful actions. A cosmos in which our creative acts do not add anything that was not predetermined and that could not have been foreseen or anticipated, even by the providence of a deity, is a world that is not worth living in. Prometheus is, of course, also the deity who most fully epitomizes foresight. His very name means to think ahead. And when Zeus chains him to a rock in the Caucasus, the eagle pecking out his liver is a symbolic expression of Zeus seeking to devour and appropriate the superior power of precognition, projection, and anticipation that is characteristic of Prometheus. However, the purpose of this definitively Promethean power is to expand our scope of free will and self-determination, not to constrain it with a sense of inexorable fate. Foreseeing possible futures, whether by the intuitive means of precognitive clairvoyance or through rational projective analysis or a balance of both, actually affords us the opportunity to become the masters of our own destiny. Various factors do condition thought, constrain the will, and limit the imagination, but the capacity to exercise individual freedom at some level despite these factors is a sine qua non of any meaningful conception of existence. Only a discontinuous and somewhat internally dissonant cosmic structure, which always preserves a degree of chaos, allows for this kind of creative individuality. Understanding such a structure precludes and is mutually exclusive of a putatively scientific commitment to mechanistic reductionism, religious faith in an omniscient and omnipotent God, 
and the belief that there should or ever can be an end to violent struggle and strife. Any entity falsely claiming omniscience and omnipotence so as to demoralize people by subjecting them to the illusion of the futility of resistance is simply Zeus by another name. Prometheus redefines the preconceived limits of the possible, making the putatively impossible possible by means of technological science. The Prometheist has the strength to grasp the burdensome fact that the truth is what works. Knowledge is not the mirroring of an objective reality by a subjective cognition that only needs to be rendered more perceptive and precise, like a mirror that requires polishing. Knowledge is radically pragmatic because technology is ontologically prior to science, which is inseparable from the technology that makes theoretical research possible and renders knowledge discoverable. Rather than distinguishing science from technology and misconstruing technology as applied science, we should always conceive of them as the unified phenomenon of technoscience, wherein theoria is inconceivable apart from praxis. Scientific knowledge is the white light of molten metal in the forge of industrious innovation. Science ought not to be confined within any particular paradigm, which also constrains technological innovation. Instead, various paradigms and the theories that they make possible ought to be seen as different scientific models that each offer us the potential to craft certain types of technological tools for handling things better and ultimately for expanding the horizon of our achievable aims. Multiple and mutually inconsistent paradigms can be exploited simultaneously for the sake of their power to foster discovery and act as a framework for invention. As the deity whose mind races ahead to survey the most distant horizons of possible futures, Prometheus also offers us inspiration as a sacred fountainhead of creativity. The inspirational power of beauty is an expression of the evolutionary force. A seduction to surmounting perceived limitations is what ought to resonate within oneself in the face of the harmonic proportionality or dynamic tension of an aesthetic work, whether in literature, painting, architecture, music, or performance art. Aesthetic experience should be an encounter with an expression of ascendant life, not for the sake of inspiring an awe that suffocates and dwarfs the soul, but with a view to kindling personal genius. Inspiration always involves a feedback loop with possible futures so that the creativity it affords us can generate forms and architectonics that are never merely a repetition of the past. This also means that however archaic certain elements of an aesthetic work may be, an orientation toward the future is necessary for it to be rightly deemed beautiful rather than awfully monstrous in its titanic brutality. Evolutionary openness and an overcoming of alienation without the loss of individuality is characteristic of Prometheus aesthetics. Prometheus rebels against his fellow titans on behalf of the Olympians and then rebels against these gods who prove equally tyrannical for the sake of man. Resistance to any authority that is perceived to be arbitrary and illegitimate is integral to the Prometheus ethos. Governments are legitimate power structures only insofar as they serve to secure industrious and exploratory enterprises. The only justification for sovereign power, namely the force of law over the lives of citizens in any state, is to secure the liberty of those individuals to pursue their projects. A Prometheist government would unchain all productive economic forces while protecting the industrious individual who ought to be superhumanly empowered thereby from an instrumental dehumanization and existential degradation. It is not the business of government to legislate morality or propagandize about the meaning of life. The liberty of individuals is limited with justification only when that constraint serves the purpose of ultimately securing the same individuals freedom from collective coercion and freedom for the personal pursuit of meaning 
purpose, wonder, and creative power. The constitutional order of any regime should reflect this conception of justice in the sense of the justification of state power. Every other political order or disorder ought to be considered a type of tyranny to be resisted or an anarchy that invites tyranny to fill the vacuum of chaos with rigid order. The willingness of Prometheus as a loving father to sacrifice himself as a martyr for the sake of emancipating his children makes him the most ethical of all deities. While this tragic martyrdom is certainly a symbol of salvific forbearance, that it is suffered and endured as a punishment for offering us techno-scientific empowerment and unleashing our artistic creativity should also be read as a recognition of the fact that cultivating ethos personally and socially is about the pursuit of excellence. This means that the Prometheus will have no tolerance for the putatively moral outrage that calls for so-called social justice by valorizing disability and resentfully desecrating and destroying everything that memorializes the achievement of those who excelled in various endeavors. It also means that any morality that demands adherence to a code of conduct that is arbitrarily imposed, as in a religious revelation, or affirmed merely on the basis of ossified customs and in the name of ancestral authority, is fundamentally unethical. Individuation is indispensable to being an authentic and conscientious person who can contribute to fostering an ethical society, which in turn provides children with an environment that encourages them to excel. An ethos, a character or moral fiber geared toward the progressive enhancement of capacities for creative expression does depend to some extent on embracing a mythos. Personal meaning cannot be forged by fiat from out of a cultural historical vacuum. Individuals need to draw from the mythic structures of living traditions and the archetypes that sustain these structures on the level of the collective unconscious. But ethical conduct always involves a situational adaptation and appropriation of this heritage, not a subservience to it that is tantamount to a tyranny of the past over present and future generations. Our traditional heritages ought to inspire us in a daimonic fashion rather than subject us to demonic possession. With a view to these psychological and sociological considerations, the mythos of Prometheus is the most progressive archetypal basis for an ethical post-singularity society. And uh, that's the conclusion there, folks. Um, thank you so much uh, for that, Jason. I think I'll, I'll kick off the, the discussion here with with my own question, if, if people don't mind. And I would like to ask you more uh, of a, for, for more of a development of the, of the kind of Promethean ethics, because the, um, the future that you were alluding to with, with so many technological possibilities, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and so on, it's gonna uh, make us face many very difficult and problematic ethical dilemmas on how we are going to use this technology. So I was just wondering, what's your kind of um, ethical, maybe also socio-political vision of how these decisions should be made and on, on the basis of what principles should be engaging with, with such complicated uh, conundrums? So let me start by putting this in the simplest and most relatable terms. In other words, by translating it into a very conventional uh, terminology. Um, I don't know, it might surprise you, might not surprise, depend, depending on Lord knows what you've heard about me, uh, might surprise you that I wrote my master's thesis on um, universal human rights. Okay, and so I engaged extensively with liberal political theory, all the way from the time of the Marquis de Condorcet, you know, through the French Revolution, and up to the framing of 
you know, basically from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen in the French Revolution up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations at the end of the Second World War. Analyzing the philosophical foundations of those documents um, was at the core of my, uh, my master's work. And so in a way, I could say to you that Prometheus ethics is a kind of progressive liberalism that has been made self-consistent uh, and that also abandons abstract rationalism, overly abstract rationalism, in a recognition uh, of the role of the collective unconscious and of archetypal forces in shaping uh, human psychology and society. Okay, so in other words, Prometheus ethics would consist of maximizing the liberty of the individual, very much in the vein of John Stuart Mill, right? Maximizing the liberty of the individual up to the point at which uh, a person's scope of action threatens the liberty of another individual. However, it departs significantly from modern rationalist liberalism in acknowledging that that uh, ethos, that ethic, is not something abstractly universal or something that could be argued for on the basis of purely rational principles. Rather, it reflects uh, the power of a certain archetype over a particular society. Okay, that, that kind of free-spiritedness that developed in various successive phases over the course of Western civilization is a reflection of the Promethean spirit that was at the fountainhead of Western civilization in the first place, or you could say the torch that lit the fire of the Western civilization in the first place, beginning in the epoch of Aeschylus. It's not something that, uh, you know, you can rationally convince all societies on the earth to accept as if you're arguing you know, from some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, discernment of the structure of the macrocosm of the, of the cosmos and, you know, prevailing upon people to try to have this reflected in the microcosm of the type of rational mind that Enlightenment thinkers believe that we had. No, it reflects the ethos of our society and it's shaped the Western world and perhaps certain other Indo-European societies in particular uh, on an archetypal level for at least a few thousand years. And so... This, this uh, you know, ethic that was at the heart of liberalism needs to be recognized as something with an archetypal basis. And what that also means is that you have to recognize that certain religions and ideologies are radically incompatible with it. So one of the biggest problems that I looked at in my master's thesis was that the people who framed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations failed to realize that giving uh, the denizens of the world an unqualified right to freedom of religion was opening the door for the um, undermining of other fundamental human rights on the basis of certain fundamental religious convictions. Okay, and, and as a matter of fact, they realized this to some extent and they had, they had uh, you know, heated arguments over it. But in the end, they decided to formulate this freedom of religion in a totally unqualified manner, saying that each person has the right to fundamental uh, religious convictions on all matters of significance in life. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but, you know, a fundamentalist Muslim is certainly going to strip women of their equal human rights or, uh, you know, prevent people from exercising their freedom of conscience when their, uh, you know, intellectual writing uh, con uh, contradicts the... Uh, principles of uh, of Islam and uh, is branded heresy in light of the the edicts of the Quran. So, point being, uh, from the Prometheus perspective, that progressive ethos of liberalism has to be seen for what it really is, namely a kind of religious faith in its own right, a, a positive ethos, uh, which is radically incompatible with other competing um, religious and ideological. Uh, frameworks or belief systems. Let me take any reflection from you on that, and then if you want, you can draw me out further on the question. Um, I think I think I'll, I'll let I'll let others um, 
others ask their questions and if we can maybe come back to that uh, later but yeah thank you for that thank you for that answer it gives me a little bit of, of, a, of a background on how you're thinking on these issues anyway I have a question. So you seem to formulate your views uh, in an archetypical way, and, and, and your so the, the main symbol of your strategy being uh, Prometheus. I wonder, in the original myth, there's that dichotomy between Prometheus and Epimetheus, and uh, what what constitutes or what would constitute in this case the Epimethean way of life? What what are you going to? As a Promethean being, what are we opposing, or what what are we going to be challenged by uh, in the case of this dichotomy of this this uh, counterforce? Yeah, who so, embraces or who embodies the uh, Epimethean way of life? Great question. So, um, I mean, I don't know what your philosophical backgrounds all are, and how many of you are familiar with Heidegger. But basically, if you have any familiarity with you know existential phenomenology, my simple answer would be. The Epimethean mindset is the uh, the mindset of Dasman. It's the uh, unreflective mass consciousness of the collective, uh, the herd mentality, as Nietzsche would put it, which which only ever at great pain recognizes something after the fact and in hindsight, right? Damn, we should have seen that, you know, coming. Uh, and so that kind of forgetfulness um, and... Um, a reflection that is too late, really, to address certain challenges that comes only after the fact of some calamity uh, is the mindset that we certainly want to avoid going into the technological singularity because the rate at which change is taking place uh, and challenging our fundamental social structure is such that before we recognize that we haven't adequately addressed these challenges, we're going to wind up in a deplorable situation that's going, that's going to be very difficult to set right again. Right. So um, and I think that, you know, this is what I was getting at at the outset of the talk in referring to uh, the traditionalist mindset and the attitude of somebody like Rene Gunon toward um, this singularity that I think in some way he envisioned and that he described as the coming of the Antichrist. The traditionalist mindset is going to be that Epimethean uh, attitude, which only after our failure to successfully navigate the technological singularity is going to look back on the catastrophe that was the 21st century and say, oh, damn, I guess we should have considered such and such. And at a deeper existential level, that kind of thoughtlessness uh, is, is, I think, identical to what Heidegger means when he describes the psychology of mass man or, or uh, das man. It's inauthenticity, because see, for Heidegger, authenticity always involves this acutely conscious relationship to the future. The authentic individual in the context of Heidegger's existential phenomenology is the person who can dynamically appropriate the heritage with which he's vouchsafed, but do it with a view toward the future and uh, consequently become someone who helps his people claim their destiny. So this Promethean mindset, the, the mindset of Promethea, is, I think, very much a characteristic of existential authenticity, whereas uh, the Epimethean mindset uh, is the inauthenticity of mass man. Uh, if I can ask a question, I'm, I'm curious, what will the effect of the singularity, a singularity point be on the very <clears throat> activity of philosophizing? How, how radically transformed will it be? And then thus can even, so if we if we consider philosophizing as hopefully preparing us to be more conscious for whatever a future may hold, well, is this the simple condition of reality so drastically altered that any conception we have of philosophizing doesn't hold? You know, um... That's a damn good question. I, uh, I'm looking at a black screen here for some reason. But in, in any case, uh, that's an excellent question and one which um, I have often asked myself. Uh, in other words, what are the conditions of possibility for philosophy? Because for most of, I was going to say for most of human history, but 
what I mean is that if you include so-called prehistory, then for most of human history, uh, both in an anthropological and, and historical sense, there wasn't anything like philosophy. And so some very particular social conditions made philosophy possible in um, the Greek portion of the Persian Empire uh, in the sixth century BC. And so, and you know, that had a lot to do with the, the rise of a literary culture and with the development of writing and with the transformation of human consciousness by writing, which an excellent book on that, by the way, is uh, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. I don't subscribe entirely to his thesis where it has to do with the structure of the brain and, and potential changes in the structure of the brain leading to a different uh, human perception of the world and so forth. But be that as it may, he really shows you uh, how dramatic this transition was from the oral mindset of the Homeric culture to the written culture of Plato. And this was a very late development in, in human history. And, uh, you know, I think part of what Heidegger is saying when he traces out the history of technological science and he actually begins with Plato and says that Platonic rationalism is the starting point for what ultimately leads through this transformation in Descartes to modern, you know, technological science. Part of what Heidegger is saying is that this arc that, be that began with the literary culture of the epoch of Plato and so transformed our consciousness so as to make philosophy possible, this arc ultimately will come to an end with the culmination of technological science. And Heidegger, in fact, speaks of the end of philosophy. I mean, you know, in his later writings, Heidegger uh, talks about how this trajectory that began with Plato will ultimately um, come to a culmination in the end of philosophy and that the kind of poetic thinking that takes place after that will be qualitatively different in some way. So, look, uh, I think it's, it's a very serious question um, to contemplate. Uh, I think I would be foolish to tell you that I had any definitive answer to it because um, I would be presuming to be able to think from the other side of the technological singularity uh, in a more perspicacious way than I think uh, is possible at this time. Um, so, you know, okay, let me just add to that, that if we successfully navigate the integration of cybernetic technologies and constructive enhancements and augmentations of our capacities through biotechnology, the closer we get to the technological singularity, the more feasible it might become for us to be able to answer that question that you're posing. And we have to keep asking it. Maybe I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to, to my question about ethics and your answer that you're coming at this from a kind of liberal, maybe humanistic point of view. And I was just wondering, how do you kind of square that with the kind of post-human or, or superhuman future that, that we're looking at? Are these con constructs of like um, the individual or like the human being going to survive uh, the singularity? Are, are we going to have to update these with with a kind of new uh, basis uh, of, of an ethical subject? And when you were talking about these ideas of like the good and how it, it seemed that the kind of the, the Promethean man uh, or the Promethean subject must have you know, the, the ethical requirements of, of living in that society are much higher than, than they are now. So I was just wondering how you think we can uh, possibly get to that and uh, how a kind of liberalism uh, will, will be sufficient uh, in, in ethical questions of such sorts. Right. Um, look, uh, the, the answer in terms of liberalism and, and the progressive uh, um, ideology and human rights and so forth was meant to, to kind of translate things in more conventional and understandable terms. Uh, of course, you're right that we need whole new concepts, and that's what I'm trying to do with the development of Prometheism. 
Um, but I think this is a, the following is a is a uh, perhaps illuminating answer to your question. There is uh, this political philosopher. I, I don't know, political theorist might be more appropriate to call him, Eric Vogelin, um, that uh, we have in America, uh, who wrote a study on science and, um, what was it? What was it called? It's a study of basically Gnosticism in politics. I think it was called Science and Gnosticism. In any case, um, and uh, in, in this text, Vogelin, who's coming from a kind of conservative Catholic perspective, uh, you know, the kind of Catholic perspective that basically appropriates Aristotle as the epistemological framework for its uh, worldview. And Vogelin, coming from out of this perspective, says that these humanists or progressives like the Marquis de Condorcet in the French Revolution, right, um, all the way up through Auguste Comte and, uh, you know, uh, he includes Hegel and Marx as well. He says that humanists and progressive thinkers of the Age of Enlightenment are actually Gnostics who are engaged in a kind of satanic enterprise. And that Nietzsche's death of God is the legitimate culmination and unveiling of the essence of liberalism and humanism, that humanists want to murder humanity. This is what Vogelin says. He says that if you want to preserve humanity, you should see things the way that Aristotle, you should see human nature and the properly ordered society the way that Aristotle and the Catholic Church does. Because if you set this, let's say, Promethean standard, and in fact he references Prometheus a few times in his study, if you set this Promethean standard for human development, what you're really doing is calling for humanity to murder itself in the course of these revolutionary restructurings of society that effectively function as meat grinders, okay, beginning with the French Revolution and on through the Russian Revolution and so forth. And I think there's something to what Vogelin is saying. Um, so what there is to, Vogelin, uh, to Vogelin's point is that humanism is not about affirming some fixed human nature the way that, say, Marquis de Condorcet may have imagined that it was. Humanism is about the unlimited human potential for transformation. Humanism has a vision for humanity becoming God and not needing any other God. That's what Vogelin argues in these texts. And I think he's right. And, you know, from his perspective which would also be René Ganon's perspective, that's satanic. That's the perspective that I completely embrace. So I'm an ultra-humanist, right? Uh, but what that really means is the will for humanity to transcend itself. And, you know, I would argue against these Luddites that humanity itself is a product of technology to begin with, right? Technology was there in the primate community before it created humanity. And, I mean, this gets a little bit spooky, you know, when you think of it in terms of Heidegger saying that technology has a spirit, that it has an essence, it has a telos. It's a force, like, out and about haunting the world. Technology made man what we are now, and there's no reason why we should therefore limit technological development to preserve humanity as it is. Rather, we should follow through this developmental trajectory to its culmination, albeit being careful not to dehumanize ourselves and turn us, ourselves into something monstrously inhuman. Uh, so yeah, that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. I have another question, uh, just curious, because um, you didn't fully specify what's your view. Uh, it seems that uh, there's some parallels between your Faustian sort of understanding of modern man and, and the Promethean way. But if that's the case, I wonder whether the Splengarian uh, view of Faust, the Faustian man as as the one who fully embraced and, and perfected uh, Christianity and the role of Christianity in Western civilization, as many would say that is, is not great culture, but it's Christianity would actually uh, uh, sort of uh, would be the ultimate symbol of Western civilization. Uh, what is the role of Christianity? Christianity in this Promethean revolution, 
Are we supposed to? Are we supposed to overcome Christianity? Are we supposed to to despise Christianity? What what happens to this to the Christian heritage of Western civilization? Because it's, it's immense. It's, it's you can say that it's way bigger than any for any classical or antique uh, traditions. So what do we do with this heritage? I'm going to give a short answer. Well, let's see. I, whenever I endeavor to give a short answer, it never happens anyway. But I'm going to try to give a short answer, and then you can have me elaborate on it and you know flesh it out. I wrote this novel called Faustian Futurist, in which I engage with the whole idea of the Faustian. Um, as I see it, the distinction between the Faustian and the Promethean, although they're very close in some ways, is that the Faustian is a, it's a reiteration or reemergence of the Promethean within a Christian context uh, and, and filtered through a, a Christian frame of reference. So the Promethean within the context of a Christian culture becomes the Faustian. And this Faustian man is ultimately in need of redemption from God. And this Faustian man's industrious productive potential and capacity to like basically rape answers from out of nature is ultimately forgiven by God as part of a kind of divine drama, you know, that's coextensive with the salvation of humanity in general. Um, so, you know, the, the Faustian man still remains one tempted by the devil but in need of divine salvation, okay? And I think that's a Christian perversion of the Promethean. It's the Promethean, but it's the Promethean perverted within a Christian perspective. So I would very much align myself with Nietzsche in this regard and say that what we need is a total overcoming of Christianity. And one of the reasons why I chose Prometheus as the symbol uh, around which to orient a movement aimed at developing an ethos that's capable of guiding our way through the technological singularity is because Prometheus is not dependent upon Christianity. Prometheus and the Promethean were there for hundreds of years before Christianity. And not just in the West. I've made long art, you know, I've written extensively about Iran. Uh, you know, one of my other areas of study is Iranology. And I've shown how the Promethean is very present in ancient Iran as well. And perhaps, uh, actually, the, uh, the image of, of Prometheus that Aeschylus sets forth in you know, the end of the archaic period in Greece may have been inspired by Zoroastrian or Mithraic uh, influence you know, during the Persian colonization of Greece. Be that as it may, the point is the Promethean has hundreds of years of history, potentially going back to Zarathustra, before Christianity. And the Promethean will have hundreds of years of history, millennia, hopefully, of history after Christianity is dead and gone. Okay, so that's why I chose that. Uh, I would have been just as happy to choose Lucifer and say that I'm advocating some kind of Luciferian whatever, except that the Luciferian is dependent upon Christianity, like the Faustian. So, um, yeah, that's my answer to that question. Do you want me to expand on it in any way, or was that responsive enough? I was very curious because you, I remember you mentioned that the, the Promethean sacrifice was, was what made Prometheus the ultimate sort of uh, ethical uh, figure because of sacrifice. And, and for me, that seems, uh, well... I, I, well think we that, I think that Christ is an ape. I think that sacrifice. Jesus is an ape of Prometheus. Okay. I think that if you look at the message in the Gospels, I mean, look, I'm not saying anything new here. You know, I mean, this here I'm very aligned with Nietzsche. There are places where I'm much more aligned, let's say, with someone like Heidegger, and there are aspects of my thought that are more platonic. But when it comes to, to, to Jesus and Christianity, I'm largely aligned with Nietzsche. Although I would also say this, and this is an important caveat, I agree with Nietzsche as well that Christianity... Uh, very much deepened the Western soul and that we should not circumvent Christianity or 
excise it from the, the, the organism of Western civilization, that Christianity is not something that should be set aside or, and we shouldn't act like it never that happened. My question. That was my question. What? That was my question. What should we do with the Christian heritage? We have to, we... It has to be inverted. Lucifer has to come to be seen as the hero. The Bible has to be interpreted in a satanic fashion. And this has to become a it has to become a large scale social reality that the Bible is it was a a profound contribution to the increasing complexity of our culture and to you know the deepening of the suffering of the European soul, frankly, but uh, in a way where the protagonist winds up being the serpent in Eden or the dragon of the apocalypse. Yeah. It's dark material. Yeah. I, I think there is a, I think there is a question in the in the chat if you can see it by Harry. He asks about developing his psychical powers. I think. Uh, if the question is meant at all seriously, rather than as a joke, uh, I would what I would refer you to um, would be remote viewing training. And you have to be careful because there are quite a few charlatans now <clears throat> in this area. But if you can find somebody who was part of the uh, either CIA or Department of Defense remote viewing program in the United States, which ran from the late 70s up through the end of the Cold War around, you know, uh, I think the program was defunded in 1992. If you can find somebody, and they're mostly old guys now, who was part of that program who's offering remote viewing training, there are a number of them who are quite reliable uh, one of them, you know, who I know personally, is Lynn Buchanan. And Lynn, Lynn was actually the trainer for all the other ACE remote viewers. He taught all the other ACE remote viewers in the Stargate program. Uh, and one of the characters in, um, in that movie, uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, is actually based on Lynn Buchanan. So he, he is among a number of these people who offer remote viewing training. And I think that that kind of training is probably the most uh, rigorous, disciplined, effective gateway to the cultivation of other latent psychic abilities. Thank you. Any other questions for Jason here or on, on the Zoom call? I can't I can't um, hear the question. I can't hear the question for some reason. I said um you speak about the Promethean in its inextricable relation to technology and uh, how to kind of look forward to use technology and how to create a society where where everybody can kind of have this kind of foresight, I suppose. Um, and my question, I suppose, is do you really think this is a kind of possible future where you can have a society of this kind? I mean, you have, this is a very, I, I, would, I would see this as a very utopian perspective that, that you can have this Holy, kind of Promethean uh, foresight among among a society of any kind. Do you think that this is kind of a, a real possibility? I think, um, and and you can find like, for example, in Plato, a similar way of thinking where you replace Promethean with philosophic, where not everybody can be a philosopher in a society. You can't have this utopia, and that seems to be similar to what you're saying. Do you think this is a real possibility for the future, or do you think that we're kind of inevitable, inevitably going to be? in this kind of catastrophic Edmitian looking back on what happened. Look, it's a survival imperative. Is it utopian? Absolutely. I'm a radical utopian in the vein of Plato's Republic. It's absolutely utopian. And I also, as I suggested earlier, affirm what Vogelin said about utopian thinkers. He thinks that utopians are out to murder humanity from his Catholic 
you know, uh, Aristotelian perspective, right? He thinks people like Marquis de Condorcet and Auguste Comte and all the way through Marx were, you know, uh, well, th that they were bad news for humanity. Let's just leave it at that with their radical utopianism. Um, what I'm arguing is in some ways consistent with that, but it's also qualitatively different insofar as now it's no longer a question of making, you know, I don't know, uh, fanciful and ambitious proposals for how to reorganize society. What I tried to get across in this lecture, and perhaps I failed in doing so, is that it's a survival imperative because, look, I mean, even if you take half of the technological developments that I was discussing and you game out how these are going to converge with each other and what kinds of social and, and political challenges they're facing us with, if we don't find some way to reorganize society, to constructively integrate these developments, there's going to be an utter catastrophe on this planet within the next 30 years, okay? And don't think that, you know, the movers and shakers of this world, people in finance and industry who are the largest stakeholders, aren't aware of this problem. They're aware of it. And the government of China is also aware of it, okay? As it designed, you know, the China, we think in terms of four-year elections. The Chinese think in terms of 50-year development plans, right? That's their Confucian mindset. And so the Chinese are well aware of things like this. And here's the problem. If we don't wind up being able to transform society in a way that we can integrate these technological developments, the decision will be made for us from above at the level of the Chinese government, at the level of leaders of industry and, you know, key financiers in the West. The decision will be made for us to deliberately deindustrialize the planet and regress us to a neo-agrarian, neo-feudal model where most people don't have access to these technologies. Okay? And the whole discourse around it will be, well, we have to save the planet. This is the most environmentally friendly way to live. And look how much damage the modern age did. And it was an age of cruelty and wickedness and, you know, uh, inhumanity. And, you know, it's all this, all this, you know. And they're going to try to create some kind of harmonic convergence of all the great world religions on the basis of some putative universal tradition. Mark my words. If we don't get our shit together, pardon my French, that is going to be the conclusion, okay? So when you ask me, am I a utopian? Yeah, I'm a utopian. What I'm saying is utopian. But it's not utopian in the same way that, you know, Auguste Comte was a utopian because this is no longer a matter of fanciful, idealistic proposals for how we might or might not reorganize society, like what Plato proposed in Republic. Now it's a survival imperative. And... Do I think it's possible? If I didn't think it was possible, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, right? I think it's possible, but only at tremendous cost. And here, again, I think my, you know, my adversary intellectually, Eric Vogelin, is absolutely right. This will only be done at tremendous cost. Uh, I have another question. You mentioned earlier with Eric Vogelin, um, his relation to Nazism, um, and you seem to affirm a, a, your own relation to that to the sect. And your, even your figure of the Promethean seems very um, similar, if not identical, to the Gnostic demiurge, even in the relation to the literal tradition of the craftsman. Um, we can even go further with the, the relation to technology as creating man in the way that this demiurge creates the universe and so on. But if technology is also the um, uh, the kind of harbinger of this of a possible world of catastrophe, uh, um, it, it it feels like you're you're kind of deifying this demiurgic figure of Prometheus, who you know in a way kind of leads man down the road towards his own destruction, and only can, and only in your kind of utopian mindset can this be averted. Um, do you, um, yeah, sure. I can elaborate on that. So I've written about Gnosticism pretty extensively and the relationship between 
what I'm framing as Prometheism and Gnosticism is a complex one. Uh, you're right that there are aspects. Okay, so first of all, let's get this much clear. I mean, Gnosticism is a Christian phenomenon, right? So just as earlier I was talking about how it's only in a Christian context that Prometheus becomes Faust or Prometheus becomes Lucifer, uh, only in a Christian context would you attempt to describe the Promethean as Gnostic in the first place. So in, in terms of Gnosticism, we are dealing with a kind of, albeit heretical, Christian discourse. Now, it's true that there are aspects of Prometheus that are akin to the Gnostic Demiurge. And in Prometheus and Atlas, my first book, I pointed out how in particular there are a lot of aspects of Atlas, the brother of Prometheus, that are very much akin to the, uh, the Gnostic Demiurge. And I point back to the figure of the Demiurge in Plato's Timaeus, which the Gnostics draw from extensively. On the other hand, though, Prometheus is very much akin to the Gnostic Savior. So Prometheus, I would say Prometheus bears a lot more resemblance actually to the Gnostic Christ than to the Gnostic Demiurge. But there are aspects of both to Prometheus. And I don't think that's a fair characterization of Prometheus. That's imposing Christian categories onto something that precedes Christianity. It is a dichotomous Christian differentiation of light from darkness, good from evil, uh, you know, in a figure, in an archetypal figure that precedes that kind of moral uh, valuation. And the other significant difference between Prometheism and Gnosticism is that almost all of the Gnostic sects were dualists. They were either radical metaphysical dualists or they were qualified dualists like the Valentinians who believed that somehow the one at the level of the Pleroma had so dissociated itself from its, it had gone through such a process of dissociation that effectively, you know, people trapped down in this mundane realm uh, were uh, in a substantially different reality from the reality of the Pleroma and were radically alienated from the one. Whereas Prometheism is, is uh, very much aiming to deconstruct all forms of dualism. So one thing that I make very clear in my writings is that the psychical is natural. There is nothing supernatural anywhere. There's no supernatural. You know, ESP and, uh, and, and so forth are stronger in dogs and horses than in humans. This is, and, and also, I mean, even plants have shown uh, that there's morphic resin and crystals have shown, you know, studies of crystals have shown that there's morphic resonance involved. There's a kind of formative causation at work um, in those organisms that uh, is in the same type of phenomena that we deal with in human uh, psychic capacities. Rupert Sheldrake has done a lot of work on that subject. So my radical deconstruction and rejection of dualism also makes Prometheism significantly divergent uh, from Gnosticism. Those, those are the two ways in which I would qualify your statement. All right, thank you. Any other questions, guys? I think, I think this probably is a, is a good time to end the talk. Thank you so much, Jason. Absolutely, my pleasure. Course. My pleasure. It's, it's uh, intriguing to see that there's such a group of people over there in Dublin, and I hope to make it there myself at some point before too long and meet up with you all. That's great. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Great talking to you.